uh, I'd like to give uh, this morning uh, a review, overview of our uh, winter 2015-2016 uh, outlook. And um, we'll start, the outline uh, is on the next slide here. I'm going to provide first uh, a status update on current El Nino conditions, uh, as well as the, the latest outlook. Um, overall, um, then we'll move into discussing uh, climate features and the tools that were considered in making the, the winter outlook. Uh, review the outlook itself, and then discuss any other factors that may influence the, the winter 2015-2016 uh, outlook. So the first slide, let's go into it. Um, with respect to El Nino, everyone is uh, pretty much aware uh, that we have a strong El Nino in place right now, so I just want to spend a little bit of time on it just to, to update folks. Um, in general, um, warm colors indicate above normal temperatures, blue, colder than normal, and you can see overall um, uh, warm warmer than average conditions from the dateline all the way to the South American coast. Uh, we have some quite strong anomalies across parts of the East Central Pacific. Uh, some of these contours uh, range uh, anywhere between th uh, greater than three in some parts of the East Central Pacific right now. Um, this is a very large uh, climate anomaly. Uh, it, will, it will impact the climate system pretty heavily, we expect, uh, over the winter months and into this early part of the spring. Uh, if we take a look at the next slide, uh, a review of the subsurface conditions. This is uh, a cross-section along the equator uh, from zero from the surface down to 300 meters for the Pacific Basin, basically. If you take a look from the date line uh, to the east, um, let me use my pointer here um, to help. Um, from, the, from the date line to the east, uh, we have this large area, a reservoir, uh, of warmer than average water. Uh, some of these anomalies in the East Central Pacific uh, from about 130 west to 100 west um, are actually greater than six degrees above normal. Um, some of the other uh, shade, this, goes, this is about to 120 to 150 meters in depth. So there's a large reservoir of warm water to help sustain this event and likely sustain it at a strong strength through the winter months uh, into the early, at least through the winter months at the current time. We go to the next, one of the things that we need to look for, of course, with respect to the outlook, um, teleconnections is how the atmosphere is responding in the tropical atmosphere. Uh, what I have shown here are three images. One at the top is a proxy for tropical rainfall, it's outgoing long wave radiation. Blue shades indicate enhanced rainfall compared to normal. Uh, red shades suppress rainfall compared to normal. And the idea here is with the warmer SSTs, we would like to see convection and rainfall enhance across the central and eastern Pacific, which has been happening for the last several months. So that's a very strong signal, as well as drying across parts of uh, Indonesia. Uh, what we typically expect during El Nino events, which we're also seeing, is the change in the circulation, the wind field. Um, the low-level winds are shown in the middle plot. And Errors that point from left to right, which is what's shown across much of the Central Pacific, basically indicates a weakening of the uh, easterly trade winds. And that's been happening as, as well. That's established. And in the upper levels, we typically see easterly wind anomalies at the upper levels along the equator. And uh, just as important are anticyclonic circulations both north and south of the equator, um, which help to redistribute mass and uh, change the circulation uh, teleconnection-wise into the mid -level latitudes in the Pacific and later uh, North America. So right now we're seeing uh, nice conditions in the ocean and in the atmosphere for uh, the strong El Nino that we have going on right now. As far as a comparison, uh, what's shown here are a number of El Nino events uh, since 1990. This is courtesy of uh, Michelle LaRue. Time increases as you go to the right. And this is for the Nino 3.4 temperature anomaly. The zero line is right through here. Um, what's shown in the uh, black line is 2015, and what's shown in the CN line is uh, 1997. So that's the, the last strong event we had. And I'm just showing this to point out that at least today, this is through uh, September, um, we're seeing very similar behavior, at least with this particular event, as far as the Nino 3.4 region, uh, up through the current time uh, of the year um, overall. And if we take a look at a little bit more closely, um, this is a time longitude diagram. Uh, this is a time longitude diagram. Uh, time increases as you go down uh, down um, in a panel. Uh, this is for 2000, October 2014 through uh, basically 2000, December 2015 in, in the white area. And this is where we are right now through September. 
uh, on the right hand side is the uh, example that we had from the 1997 event from October 96 through December of 1997. And it's just interesting to point this out in that we have very similar behavior. We're, we're getting the warmth shifting back to the west, expanding and increasing in intensity as we saw in 1997. And overall, um, very similar evolution at the current time um, moving forward. <clears throat> as far as predictions go, um, overall, um, the What's shown here for the Nino 3.4 region is the number of predictions from statistical and dynamical models. This is the mid-October 2015 uh, plume from uh, IRI and CBC. Uh, again, this is the Nino 3.4 region, and zero is uh, the middle line, and time increases as you go to the right. Uh, this is an evolution. There's a, there's a lot of spread here, of course, as there, as there often is. But what I wanted to point out is as we move through the fall, and into the early part of the winter, uh, we still expect the peak to occur during that time period. Um, it's uh, there'll be a range of values, of course, that might happen. But generally, the right now the consensus opinion uh, from CPC is an event somewhere between two and two point five, based on the uh, only only three month averages using uh, ERSS uh, ERS uh, version four data set. And from that point forward, um, we see a decrease and the SST uh, forecast values from really most all of the systems, both statistical and dynamical. The yellow line here is the dynamical model average. And if you follow that down, we go towards uh, ENSO neutral conditions uh, relatively quickly uh, as we move into the late spring and into the summer months uh, of 2016. The official outlook uh, from CPC and IRI for, for the El Nino uh, event probability as uh, a consensus forecast from a, n a number of different forecasters as probabilities on the y-axis. Again, time increases as you go on the x-axis. And uh, clearly, uh, very high probabilities through the winter months of greater than 95 percent through JFM, January, February, and March. Uh, then decreasing relatively rapidly to uh, basically ENSO neutral conditions favored by May, June, and July. As I mentioned, uh, we're under, we have an El Nino advisory for a strong El Nino event at the current time, and the, and the consensus is through the winter that we'll have a strong El Nino event uh, as well <clears throat> to continue. So uh, moving towards impacts as we get towards the uh, winter outlook, uh, it's, this is an important slide always to show um, that, that we'd like to show here. Um, certainly El Nino's, uh, in this particular case, um, is going to be favor of strong changes in the odds for certain impacts. Uh, and the percent shift does tend to be larger for stronger El Nino events. Um, but to, as I think many people can understand, uh, and uh, can understand that the impacts are never guaranteed. Uh, there's in seasonal climate prediction. Um, these are unpredictable. There are other unpredictable elements, which I'll talk about uh, later, that certainly influence the result. But if we take a look in a probabilistic sense, which our forecasts are, this is just kind of an example of how some of the shift we might have with respect to this is an example for precipitation. But it works the same way with temperature, of course. And we're just talking about shifts in the odds of the distribution from one uh, equal chances of 33, 33, 33 to something that, uh, based on El Nino impacts, will be larger for certain uh, temperature or precipitation uh, in certain regions of the country. So uh, what I want to first show is uh, an, uh, composites uh, of six strong El Nino events. Uh, for temperatures, and this is again anchored to the 1981 to 2010 climatology. Uh, the yellow shades and red shades indicate above normal temperatures, the blue shades below normal temperatures. And generally, uh, with these events on average, um, we have found for the most part generally a warm across the northern tier of the United States, so parts of the northern and central region uh, favor favoring uh, above normal temperatures during a strong El Nino events. Uh, generally, a tilt towards below normal across parts of the southern region. Um, and then we see an intermediate zone across parts of the Tennessee Valley, uh, lower mid-Atlantic, and uh, central Mississippi Valley. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we also make use of in uh, our, temperature, our temperature forecasts, uh, both temperature and precipitation forecasts uh, for the seasonal time range are, are trends. And uh, we have a tool here. It's called optical climate normal. It's basically just a trend tool that makes that does a comparison between the last 15 years of data versus 30-year climatology. And all I'm, I'm saying here for the forecast in this particular case is that the trends were really only a factor across the west 
uh, this, for this season, this year, and a little bit along parts of the Northeast and New England region. <clears throat> there were slight negative trends based on some of the cooler years across parts of the interior. One thing I want to show is we take a look at analogs as well. This is a constructed analog, so this makes use of many years, not just a few years, and these are objectively combined uh, based on using uh, where the weights are the highest for closely matching analogs. And this is based on global SST, so it makes use of SST not only in the uh, equatorial region of the Pacific, but also the North Pacific and the Atlantic Basin. And this is where one of the greatest uncertainties are in the outlook is across parts of the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, this is often the case, but uh, especially uh, with this particular uh, year, this particular tool is, has some predictors that are trying to tap into some of the patterns we've had recently over the last couple of winters where we have had more ridging along the West Coast and across parts of the North Pacific funneling colder air. Um, so it's, it's basically favoring a little bit more colder signature further north into the Mid-Atlantic in parts of uh, New in the Great Lakes, Eastern Great Lakes region, uh, than say some of the model guides, which I'll show in a second. But there's good consistency for warmth from across California along the northern tier and across parts of New England in this particular tool. If we look at dynamical model guidance, um, this is uh, computer examples or in, uh, simulation forecast plots for temperature anomalies for December, January, and February for from seven models as part of the North American multi-model ensemble. Just want to show the range of spread of these particular forecasts. The CFS was the warmest solution of them all, uh, really influenced by a strong El Nino sort of pattern, uh, favoring above average temperatures down to the Gulf Coast, basically, with very high uh, anomalies across parts of the northern tier. Uh, some of the other models, most of the other models tend to have uh, less of that signature, more across parts of the uh, northern uh, Great Lakes, northern plains, and parts of the northeast, uh, with a cold signature across the southeast, predominantly, in all of these solutions. Um, overall, the CSCS M4 from NCAR uh, was a warmer solution, um, but that was generally discounted because of the signature that we see in, in across parts of Alaska, which is really not consistent with uh, El Nino uh, conditions. We'd like to take a look at the probabilistic version of the NMME, which makes use of counts of the ensemble members. And if you take a look at that, the 40% probability line for above uh, is mainly across um, uh, the central Ohio Valley. Uh, central mid-Atlantic region and back across parts of the central plains and then down towards California with the low number of temperature probabilities elevated over uh, climatology uh, across the southern regions from Texas to basically the Atlantic coast and parts of uh, Florida. The, the official outlook for um, December, January, and February from CPC is a compromise from a lot of these different uh, systems uh, as well as a strong El Nino event. Uh, favoring above normal temperatures uh, with a slight tilt in the odds. Keep in mind these are probabilities and the, 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 the first shade of yellow is just a hill greater than 33% to 40% across parts of the central uh, Mississippi Valley, lower Ohio Valley into the uh, lower mid-Atlantic mid region. The highest probabilities for above average temperatures were across the very far northern Great Lakes where we had support from strong El Nino events. The highest probabilities from the North American multi-model ensemble uh, information and had consistent results with some of the statistical tools. Where we have our biggest concern and the uncertainty is greatest is in this region where we had some variation uh, between the statistical tools that I mentioned uh, as well as from as compared to the dynamical model guidance. Um, and so EC is favored in a large area uh, from the lower mid-Atlantic westward to the central and southern parts of the central uh, Mississippi Valley. Uh, overall, favoring below normal temperatures again uh, from along the southern tier uh, of the U.S. and in the southern region. We turn towards uh, precipitation. Um, what's shown here are uh, El Nino, strong El Nino events from 1950. Um, there's seven events here, and the main point to, 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 that I want to take away from uh, to discuss here is this: the high variability that we see. Other, other than really the southern region across parts of the Gulf Coast in Florida and southeast, um, there is quite a bit of variability with these, even these strong events. 
Um, so our highest probability in our outlook are actually across parts of the southeast, and I'll show that later. But you can see quite a bit of variability, not only across the west, but also uh, across the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes region. Uh, um, during certain El Nino events, you can actually get wet conditions well up into parts of Iowa and Illinois. Other years, it's more dry, more of a more dry across the central uh, parts of the central region and eastern region. Uh, more typical of what we see in, in composites of all El Nino events, but you can see a lot of spread here. Um, so some of our lowest, we have EC and lower probabilities for dry across parts of the Ohio Valley, and I'll show that in a, in a little bit. As far as the tools go with precipitation, um, this is the same sort of analog forecast that I showed with temperature. Again, this is an objective combination of a uh, number of different years based on global SST, so it's weighting certain years, and it weights the years that closely match current conditions the most. And if you take a look at this, it's not very, very similar to uh, general El Nino composites, uh, basically wet along the southern tier and up the eastern seaboard, a dry signal to varying degrees across the Great Lakes and parts of the Ohio Valley, dry in the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rockies as well, and also wet across parts of Calif much of California. With respect to the model guidance for precipitation, there's, uh, again, more spread, as uh, is not surprising. Um, in general, you see uh, overall consistency with an El Nino forecast for the most part in the CFS is what along the southern tier uh, up the eastern seaboard. But what we found with this particular forecast, the North American multi-model ensemble is a little bit wetter than it was last month, uh, with less probabilities uh, for dry further to the south. And if you take a look at the ability forecast for, uh, from the NMME for the three, three classes, uh, this is what you see. Um, it generally has been, was wetter across uh, much of the southwest and southern plains from previous um, forecasts, um, but maintains uh, high probabilities for above median precipitation along the southern Gulf, along the Gulf Coast and up the eastern seaboard, with generally favoring below median precipitation across parts of the Great Lakes, uh, northern Ohio Valley, back along the northern tier of the U.S. into the northern Rockies. This is a little bit of a shift, a little bit of a shift north uh, of the dry areas from previous model guidance. Um, so we had, we did shift our area a little bit further to the north. Um, during all El Nino events, when you consider them, there's more of a dry signal down through here um, further to the south. So we'll see how this plays out, and we'll be updating the December, January, February outlook, of course, uh, in mid-November. So this is the, the official outlook for precipitation. I want to start with the above median areas. Uh, again, uh, with the strong southern stream expected, the southern, southern and uh, southward and eastward shifted storm track, generally favoring above average precipitation across the southern tier of the U.S., um, with probabilities uh, quite high across parts of extreme southeast Georgia and much of Florida of greater than 70 percent. Um, probability is uh, rapidly drop off as you move back towards the northwest, um, where we favor uh, below median precipitation, again, across the Great Lakes, consistent with model guidance. Uh, basically, El Nino composites um, and some of the statistical guidance that we have as well. EC is favored through uh, from, say, Iowa and parts of the northern, north central plains southward through Arkansas, and again in a, in a region in between the two uh, centers of action uh, across western parts of the Appalachians into western New England. Another thing to point out during the winter season is the enhanced odds of severe weather across parts of the southeast, especially during January and February with a strong jet expected across the southern tier of the United States. Uh, I just want to move forward to show how the uh, the Forecast coverage and probabilities maximize in January, February, and March. Uh, this is an example of February, March, and April, just to give you an uh, insight as to how the outlooks vary uh, as we get later into the winter, into the early spring at the current time. Um, we, during that period, uh, we tend to see more of a, during El Nino events, uh, more of a cold signal a little further to the north. So this area slowly migrates during JFM and FMA. Uh, and a receding somewhat of the above average uh, temperature forecast region. For precipitation, probabilities begin to drastically drop off um, for above median precipitation. For the area of dry conditions, usually uh, as we get later in the winter, the stronger signal 
the signal across parts of the Great Lakes and Ohio Valley is often more uh, has more coverage and actually is a stronger signature. So that is maintained at this at the current levels through February, March, and April. Um, so other factors that are going to affect the winter outlook. Um, many of you are familiar with the Madden Julian oscillation. This is a disturbance that is um, originates in the tropics and uh, is basically a uh, rainfall pattern, which is shown here on the bottom right in animation. It's a rainfall couplet pattern uh, where drier and wetter conditions on a large scale move eastward through the global tropics. And the reason this is important is this can sometimes change the circulation in the mid-latitudes um, and produce similar impacts to ENSO, but on a shorter time scale. But I, what I will say during strong El Nino episodes in which we find ourselves in now and most likely through the winter, is that the MGO activity, which has already been borne out over the last few weeks and last several weeks and few months, is that the MGO activity is typically less active. Uh, so this may not be a strong player uh, this particular winter, but I did want to mention it. Uh, one thing we see often with MGO activity um, is we, can, we tend to have more extremes globally. Um, if we do get an MGO event during uh, this period, again, which is less, uh, less favored during strong El Ninos, uh, we may have even more precipitation across parts of the southern stream than even with the ENSO background state. Um, the thing that I want to show next is I'm not going to go through all of these individual phases of the MGO, but I mainly just want to show this, that uh, if we do have MGO activity during the winter, that can significantly augment the back background El Nino state in temperature and precipitation. I just hi highlighted a few phases here just to indicate that. Uh, but overall, <clears throat> um, we will see how the MGO uh, behaves during the winter months. But there will be periods, certainly during this, uh, on the subseasonal scale, where this may become a factor in augmenting the typical El Nino response to temperature and precipitation. In addition to that, of course, our other factors, the Arctic Oscillation and the North Atlantic Oscillation, these are, of course, major sources of interseasonal variability over the U.S., Atlantic, and Europe during winter. Uh, we are, even though we're favoring above average temperatures along the northern tier, there's certain winter is still going to be here. There's still going to be cold air outbreaks. There's still going to be cold periods. Um, the, these, the, these phases, these oscillations, the Arctic and North Atlantic Oscillations, modulate the circulation at the high latitudes. They tend to regulate the cold air outbreaks. Uh, but in general, overall in the season, uh, we do expect more Pacific air across much of the northern tier. And so um, we'll have to see how these, these particular oscillations. Really, it's a research issue of predictability at the seasonal time scale. Uh, there's a number of studies that do indicate at times where there may be some predictability on the seasonal time scale. Uh, but that's still open for debate um, on these time scales. So we'll have to see how these oscillations behave during the winter. Uh, last particular winter, uh, we had an uh, unusual situation where the Arctic oscillation was positive basically the whole winter or much of the winter. So we'll see, but yet we still had very cold conditions because of ridging out west. So well, these are other factors that are wild cards for the winter outlook and how the eventual winter will play out. So to summarize, uh, last slide, um, right now the official outlook favors warmer than average conditions across the western and northern portions of the nation. Colder than average is favored across parts of the eastern southwest to the southeast, especially later on in the winter. Um, with more Pacific air favored because of the El, El Nino circulation changes that, are, uh, that we favor, uh, odds are elevated for less frequent and probably short duration cold air outbreaks across parts of the interior U.S. Drier than average conditions uh, are expected for the Pacific Northwest, Northern Rockies, and Great Lakes. Wetter than average across much of the southern tier, especially across the southeast in Florida, uh, as well as later in the winter. Um, with the southern shifted storm track and enhanced uh, southern jet, uh, potential for heavy precipitation events across the south um, are, can be are elevated, as well as severe weather across parts of the southeast, including Florida, uh, especially during January and February of, of the winter. And so that I, I will end. Uh, I appreciate very much your time and attention. Thank you very much.